reading a statement. Uh, so, um, so these events have been recorded and uh, we're live streaming them to, the, to our iQuiz YouTube channel. For bandwidth purposes, uh, we request that you please keep your microphones and videos off during the talk. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, which we encourage, uh, please relay them in the chat and then we, um, I will help to communicate them. And um, at the end, feel free to turn on your video and, and join us in, in discussion. Um, so with that, it's our pleasure to have Jens Koch visiting from Northwestern Institute. Uh, so Jens did all of his education in Germany, his bachelor's degree in Kosterslautern, and then master's and PhD in Berlin. And after that, came to the US to do a postdoc at Yale University uh, with Stephen Gervin um, until 2010, at which time he started at Northwestern University uh, doing th theoretical research on hardware uh, for quantum computation and related technologies and circuit uh, QED platform. Um, and since 2017, he's associate professor He's won many awards, including the NSF Career Award and even the Yale Postdoc Prize as a postdoc. And uh, we're very happy to have him joining us virtually. And with that, Jens, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Jake. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. Um, just to echo one thing that Jake just mentioned, I, I also encourage you to, to ask questions. Um, the this, this Zoom silence uh, is, is something that I think I will never come to like. So uh, please feel free to interrupt through the chat and, and then I'll, I'll be happy to react and, and answer questions. Uh, so I um, will give a, a selection of all the things that are going on in my research group these days. Um, we've been really fortunate to join two of these large DOE centers um, was more more an accident really than intended. I, I keep telling the story, as you know, you, you play the, the lottery twice, you buy two tickets to have a better chance to win and uh, winning twice was not really something that I had considered. So we're very fortunate to be part of C2QA and, and SQMS. And, and for that reason, um, there's a bunch of topics that we're working on, um, including air protected qubits, what I decided I would talk about most today, um, but they're, other things we're very interested in, uh, including autonomous error correction, um, working with Floquet-driven uh, qubits, uh, doing quantum optimal control, uh, especially uh, on the SQMS side for uh, processing quantum information in, in uh, high Q uh, SRF cavities. And I will talk a little bit towards the end about um, this Python package called SE qubits, which um, I'm personally very excited about. I think it's been uh, somewhat successful and I'm uh, we, we're working on it, uh, continue to work on it, and, and hope that it's useful for the community, uh, for the community in your research, perhaps also in, in education. Um, many people in the audience know this uh, somehow. Uh, the, the deal seems to be that the, the, you know, as you get money, somehow you, you stop doing physics yourself to some degree, um, but you have all these great people in your, in your group who actually do, do all the important work. And uh, so this is uh, a current snapshot of, of all, the, all the people um, who, who are involved and um, some of them may, may also be lurking in the audience. And so thanks, thanks to you, um, with, without you, I, I wouldn't be sitting here giving a, an exciting talk about the research that you do. Um, and so the, the first part of my talk uh, on noise protected superconducting qubits, um, I will uh, be not, not really in line with this article that I'm listing here, but uh, in, in this article that we recently published sort of gives an overview and in part outlook, you can find many more details that I won't have time to cover today. And again, in the end, I hope I have a couple minutes to, to comment on this SC qubits package. So I think I was given instructions that um, despite the fact that IQUIST uh, calls this a seminar, it, it, it can be a broad audience and I should give uh, a good, uh, good introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll start out by saying a few general words about superconducting qubits. What are they? How do you think about them before we jump into more advanced uh, topics like you know, how do you protect them from noise? 
And so I, I think we're, we're used to this fact in, in physics that every good story starts with some harmonic oscillator. And here's mine, right? So it's, it's an LC circuit. And in superconducting circuits, we uh, make these things out of uh, superconducting material. So you don't have to worry that much about uh, ohmic dissipation. And um, indeed, uh, you can imagine charging up the capacitor with uh, some charge Q and um, I think that you, you'll get uh, oscillatory behavior uh, after half a period, uh, the energy will be uh, in the form of a magnetic flux through your inductor. And uh, so indeed you get a quantum harmonic oscillator uh, where your Hamiltonian uh, includes a charging energy term that you recognize from ENM as well as an inductive energy term. And uh, phi and Q, the magnetic flux and the charge actually turn into non-commuting variables on the quantum side. And uh, uh, lo and behold, um, you, you get something that just looks like any any quantum harmonic oscillator. You get an equidistant energy uh, spectrum. And um, that, in fact, is perhaps not yet what you would like uh, if you're after uh, fabricating and operating qubits, right? The, the fact that these energy splittings between neighboring states are all identical actually makes it a bit hard to uh, keep the system in, in just the space of the lowest two states. Uh, and it would be much easier to, to do that if we could arrange for these higher energy levels to have slightly different spacing. Uh, and, and that is where uh, a crucial ingredient uh, component for, for superconducting circuits comes in. So we'll replace the inductor up here by a Josephson junction. And that turns our quadratic potential energy term phi squared over 2L into uh, the typical cosine term. So um, for, for the purpose of of this talk in, in many places, you, you don't really have to worry that much about circuits. It's perfectly fine to imagine the system as a fictitious particle that lives in this potential energy. Uh, and so in this case, uh, the particle sees a cosine potential. And um, you know if you think about the states that localize uh, in, in the bottom of the cosine well, uh, down here, it looks like a harmonic oscillator, but due to the quartic anharmonicity uh, that you get when expanding the cosine, you see that higher energy levels are not uh, equidistant anymore, that the spacing actually diminishes a bit as you climb up in, in your cosine potential. And so a, a simple approximation to this is that you have this Kerr type uh, nonlinearity uh, with a negative uh, a coefficient here that um, makes these energies uh, become small, the energy splittings become smaller as you climb up the ladder. And that essentially is the idea of this transmon qubit that has been around for uh, a good number of years. Um, it's currently perhaps the most popular superconducting qubits used by places like IBM, Google, and, and Rigetti, and in many research groups worldwide. And I will, I will try and argue that um, not only is this qubit becoming a little bit boring, but um, may, maybe it's not the answer to everything. Maybe uh, there's actually a reason to believe that we can do better um, uh, with slightly different circuits. And so I'll um, maybe show you uh, one or two more here. So uh, if you add um, an additional inductor to the circuit on top, you get um, a new circuit called uh, the, the fluxonium circuit or fluxonium qubit. Uh, its potential energy is now a cosine overlaid on this uh, parabolic background, which comes from the inductor. Uh, and you can, you can imagine that the wave functions that live in this potential might have quite different nature than, than the ones uh, in the simple cosine potential. And in fact, if you thread an external magnetic flux through this loop, you can even shift the, this corrugation, this cosine corrugation on top of this parabolic potential. Uh, and, and you can imagine you might localize wave function in individual cosine minima, and they sort of move up in this way. Uh, some of them uh, may delocalize uh, at energies higher. And so there are different, uh, different kinds of wave functions and that, uh, that can be quite, quite interesting for, for use of, of uh, you know, uh, use of these states as, as qubit states. And then if we go further, uh, we reach a, uh, an interesting circuit, which was uh, originally proposed uh, by Brooks, uh, Kitaev, and Preskill. Um, it's a circuit that is now a little bit larger. It's shown down here. Um, and it has a two-dimensional potential energy landscape uh, if we keep things uh, simple. 
And so uh, here's a here's a fancy animation that gives you uh, an impression of this. Uh, so in one direction, it also has this parabolic background. It has cosine modulation actually in both directions. One direction is periodic. One goes along with the with the parabola. And uh, this is um, the potential of this so-called uh, zero pi qubit. And I'll I'll be talking more more about that. Before I do, let me try and motivate this a little bit more. Like, why do we want more complicated circuits? Aren't we, shouldn't we just be happy with transmons? They seem to be working fine. Google and IBM like them. Why, why do we care about something more complicated? And so it's true, transmons are quite simple circuits, right? Uh, as you can see here, they're basically two pads of metal. Uh, those form the capacitor plates, if you will. And they're just connected in the simplest case by a single Josephson junction, too small to really see, but it's in the middle there. Um, so as a theorist, it's easy for me to say that fabrication is simple, but I'm being told that uh, by actual experimentalists that fabrication is simple. Uh, and um, these circuits have been highly optimized since 2007, they, they work well. So why, why I'm making a big deal about, you know, can we do better? And, and one fundamental aspect about that circuit is that there is no intrinsic protection from spontaneous relaxation, right? You saw that what this potential energy looks like is it's a very weakly anharmonic oscillator. And for, for an oscillator, nothing is easier than to sort of jump from the, the first excited state uh, down back to the ground state as soon as that circuit couples to some, some bath, right? And so there's, there's no intrinsic protection and that's why improving C1 times and transpons has been so much work, right? There's been recently, especially a lot of material science uh, that, that, that's gone into uh, making those T1 times higher. And so the question is, can we, can we do better, right? Will transpons actually suffice for, for doing quantum error corrections and allow us to, to reach the necessary threshold and fidelities for, for all of this to work out? Um, and and uh, if, if not, can we do better and, and how? And so what is, what is the problem with fidelities, with coherence? Um, so uh, allow me, for, for those of you who are not experts, um, I will take the opportunity to give a quick introduction to noise and sort of basics of how to, how to think about it, right? So place to, to start in, in motivating the, the need for, for air protection is that no qubit is ever alone in the universe, right? Every qubit couples, hopefully weakly, to uncontrolled degrees of freedom in the environment. And for superconducting qubits, um, a variety of important noise channels uh, is known, uh, though not necessarily well understood in their microscopic origin in all cases. So the presence of uh, that noise uh, tends to reduce how quantum this quantum bit really is. And uh, you know, the, the loss of quantumness or decoherence limits gate fidelities and ultimately leads to errors in the execution of, of your quantum algorithm. So, you know, without some strategy for mitigating those errors, a future quantum computer will just keep crashing with uh, perhaps a, a windows like blue screen like this, right? Uh, your qubit ran into a problem that it couldn't handle and now it needs to restart. And um, to try and rescue HBAR from this horrible death, um, it's helpful to remember and distinguish, uh, you know, the, the two primary modes of decoherence. Um, so allow me to just run you through this uh, as a very quick uh, recap. So first of all, there's uh, depolarization uh, that has a characteristic time scale of T1. Uh, in the simplest case, depolarization corresponds to spontaneous relaxation of uh, the qubit to the ground state. So we might start in the excited state and then it spontaneously relaxes, which means that uh, any superposition perhaps that you even started from uh, is just going to reduce to, to the ground state. And the rate at which uh, this happens, so one over T1 uh, can usually be computed by, by Fermi's golden rule if uh, things are simple and well behaved. Um, so that uh, expression will involve uh, the, the spectral density S of omega uh, that characterizes the, the noise itself it's evaluated at the qubit frequency. And then 
uh, there's a matrix element that involves the operator A by which the qubit couples to the environment. And so it's these two ingredients, uh, the product of this transition matrix element and the noise spectral density that uh, influence how long or short uh, T1 is going to be. And then the second mode of, of decoherence uh, is pure dephasing. Uh, so one way to picture this in a simple manner is, uh, you, you know, the, the qubit energy splitting up here uh, undergoes uh, slow variations due to the noise. So, so here you, you see that energy splitting vary. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, the dynamical phase factors here represented as part of the off-diagonal elements of, of your qubit density matrix, those will get randomized. And so over time in the ensemble sense, your density matrix will reduce to uh, a mixed state where these, uh, these off-diagonal elements are completely absent. And again, one simple way to think about uh, this purity phasing rate and compute it is to say, well, in this case, it's the slow variations uh, that matter. So the noise actually gets evaluated at zero frequency. Um, and then uh, this factor out front is the, is the derivative of your qubit energy splitting with respect to this fluctuating parameter that I'm calling lambda here. So this is basically the linear sensitivity of your qubit frequency. To, to the noise. All right, and so we have to deal with uh, those processes. What, what do we do about them? Um, over the years, uh, several strategies have been pursued um, and uh, some of them are more difficult and at least for, from my perspective than others. Uh, so the first one is to try and actually do something about S of omega, right? Uh, this is basically saying we turn down the volume of the noise itself. It's something that theorists don't know how to do because they, they know how to do very little, but uh, you need actually material science to do this. You need to think about materials, how you fabricate. In the case of superconducting qubits, you can think about microwave engineering somehow to really reduce the amount of noise that the qubit is exposed to. Uh, strategy two is where uh, perhaps theorists can contribute something, and, and I would argue that uh, together with other groups, we, we've uh, played that game uh, for a bit now, which is, can we, can we make the qubit uh, somewhat deaf to the noise, right? Can we uh, maybe just accept that there is this noise, but um, we'll make the qubit insensitive to the, the worst noise channels that, that we know of. And as far as T1 and T5 are concerned, that means we will try and reduce uh, this transition matrix element, and we'll try to make uh, the qubit energy splitting more insensitive to the fluctuating parameter. And then finally, there's, of course, full-blown quantum error correction, right? This is a little bit like uh, putting noise-canceling headphones uh, on, on the ears of the qubit. Uh, you monitor in a smart way for, for errors that occur and then apply correction uh, whenever needed in, in some, some feedback loop. Intrinsic noise protection is what I'll be talking about. So how, how is this supposed to work in, in superconducting qubits? What, what's, what's one way to think about this? Um, here's, uh, here's how I like to think about it. Um, it's basically trying to achieve two separate things at the same time. Um, so first, let's think about depolarization. And let's, let's think about this transition matrix element that enters this product determining the, the depolarization rate. And uh, what I'm plotting here is, is a cartoon of uh, two wave functions. They, in this example, they happen to live in a two-dimensional position space. Here's the region where the ground state wave function is, uh, has, has amplitudes that are non-zero. Here's the one where the first excited uh, state wave function has non-zero amplitudes. And you see that they live, uh, so to speak, in separate regions. So if you, if you want to use fancier math language, then you might say that these wave functions have nearly disjoint support, right? There's exponential tails, and it's actually this little bit of exponential tails between them that is going to govern the magnitude of this matrix element, right? If you imagine for a moment, to, you, you might write this matrix element out as an integral in, you know, over x1 and x2, uh, there in the integrand, there are these two wave functions, and then you have some operator representing A in the middle, then, well, these wave functions uh, only uh, 
uh, meet in, in these regions, in this region where uh, all the tails are, are exponentially suppressed. And so your matrix element is going to be exponentially suppressed. Disjoint support helps with that. What do we do about purity phasing? Um, well, we said that there's this factor that uh, signifies the sensitivity of the qubit to our fluctuating parameter, here again called lambda. And uh, we can clearly make this zero or near zero if we manage to make these levels independent of lambda or very uh, little dependent uh, on, on this parameter lambda. So there are some schemes where uh, you can think about making that uh, some sort of brown state degeneracy that is, that is robust. Um, doesn't have to be a degeneracy. So uh, for example, the transmon qubit, uh, as far as offset charge, charge noise is concerned, actually has energy levels that um, are very insensitive to fluctuate fluctuations in this charge. Um, and so that, that is why, why transpons actually are nicely protected from uh, charge noise. Uh, as I mentioned, they're not well protected from depolarization. And there are other qubit examples like the flux qubit or heavy fluxonium that are sort of the other way around. They have this joint support uh, but they uh, tend to be more sensitive to some of the known dephasing channels. And so the question is, can we somehow uh, realize both of these mechanisms in, in one circuit? And over the years, there have been a lot of ideas. I already mentioned uh, Kitaev and Preskill as, as two characters who, who've worked on this topic. Uh, Lev Yoffe, Misha Gershenson have worked on this extensively. Um, and so I'm just going to give you a, a very brief and, and reduced impression of, of one idea that is common to, to a lot of these, these uh, ideas and approaches. So if you remember the Josephson junction and the cosine potential that I talked about earlier. So here it is again, and you see that there's a wave function localized down at the bottom of the cosine potential. And uh, if you think about this and write this in terms uh, of charge basis states n labeled by n, the number of Cooper pairs, then this cosine phi actually just means that, well, you can transfer one Cooper pair at a time from one side uh, of the junction to the other. Uh, that's, uh, that's in, in fact what this operator does. And uh, imagine now that we had some magic way in which we could create a cosine two phi potential maybe actually with a slightly built in a, a symmetry of this double well so that I get localized states as shown. Uh, what would that correspond to? Well, it would actually correspond to double Cooper pair tunneling. It's, it's two Cooper pairs that would want to hop across this fictitious circuit element at a time. And um, this might be interesting because indeed I get to realize um, disjoint support or nearly disjoint support. Um, and uh, if uh, the external noise sources don't change the, the overall uh, energy splitting between my two uh, potential energy wells, then um, I might indeed also have uh, protection from dephasing. And so this is where um, I'm going to show you the zero pi circuit for the first time. Um, it's not really the same as this fictitious circuit element, but um, it, it carries some of, the, some of the properties of it. So you see it's a circuit uh, consisting of two Josephson junctions, two capacitors, and two inductors. Um, and to, to uh, sort of wave my hands a little bit and, and motivate that something in that circuit um, might have to do with double Cooper pair tunneling, I'll, um, I'll uh, run you through a couple of steps. Um, what we are supposed to keep in mind is that for the zero pi circuit to work, it's not just that we have to arrange the circuit elements in this way, but they also have to be in a certain parameter regime. And so one thing to keep in mind for this circuit is that this, uh, these two inductors are supposed to have rather large inductances. So it's hard for current to flow flow through them, or at least a, a change in the current, uh, that, that would be suppressed. And so suppose for a moment that I take a Cooper pair and I have it jump across this left junction. Um, I'll see that I leave a positive charge behind. I have the Cooper pair residing on this uh, node of the circuit now. And so there's a charge imbalance and that'll uh, be reflected as charges that, that are missing or uh, added to those two capacitor plates. 
um, that state here clearly is energetically very unfavorable, right? Uh, we never see uh, capacitors with charges on one side, but not the other. And so the question is, how do I, how do I correct for that? How, do the, how does the system uh, react to, to, to change uh, that? And uh, so we could uh, wonder, well, I, I might have a current flow through the inductor, but this is where uh, you remember this inductance is very large. So that is going to be suppressed. And so the best that I might do is I'm just going to hop another Cooper pair now, one uh, here across the right junction uh, that leaves charges behind. And you see this precisely conspires so that now the two capacitors are charged in the way that, that you're used to. So in, in some ways, the zero pi qubit um, realizes this double Cooper pair tunneling in an effective way. It's not really in the form of one circuit element, but um, it's, it's uh, sort of hidden in this circuit. The zero pi, uh, at least uh, on paper, has been around for a long time. So 2013 was this uh, pioneering paper by, by Brooks, Kitaev, and Preskill. And since then, uh, we've worked on this for a while. Uh, well, it's 2022 now, you can tell. Um, and um, you know, we, we went through circuit analysis, estimated coherence times, uh, worked also to, together with Alexandre Blay on, on thinking about gate operations, uh, how to do optimal control gates. And then finally, this past year, 2021, uh, Andrew Hauck's group um, I managed to, to uh, you know, show and uh, operate uh, an, an instance of this device, um, which uh, is maybe not uh, the, the full answer yet and, and doesn't show all the promise of the circuit, um, but uh, it, it was a great step and I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, before I do, um, since I'm a theorist, I'll run you a bit through you know, the description of the circuit. Um, it has four, four nodes, uh, which means that uh, it has three active degrees of freedom, two of them uh, called phi and theta, the variables are uh, conspire to do this double Cooper pair uh, hopping. And then there's another degree of freedom, which is actually uh, purely harmonic. And if those circuit elements were pairwise identical, this uh, harmonic degree of freedom, the zeta mode would actually decouple. Um, there's a systematic way uh, of obtaining the Hamiltonian uh, for such a circuit. Um, I'm not going to bother you with the details. Um, some of you will be familiar with Hamiltonians looking like that. For, for the others, um, I think we can just switch to this picture of a fictitious particle in a potential energy again. And so this is what I'm doing on, on this slide here. Um, once this zeta mode is decoupled, um, there are two variables left. Um, one is the phi degree of freedom, which has this parabolic background with a cosine modulation on top. And then the theta degree of freedom is periodic. Um, so that is a pure cosine uh, as, you, as you go in, in this direction. And so it's an interesting looking uh, potential energy landscape. Um, some of you who are, who are more experts um, might notice that it, it actually looks like the circuit has one transmon-like degree of freedom in the theta direction and one fluxonium-like degree of freedom along the phi direction. And that's actually a, a pretty good way uh, to think about this. Um, for, for this to, to, be, to be true and, and make sense, um, there's one ingredient uh, which I should mention, which is, you know, you want your, your particle to sort of delocalize along the phi direction so that uh, perhaps the ground state localizes around theta equals zero. And then the first excited state will try and localize uh, along theta equals pi. And uh, of course, at this point, you realize why this thing is called zero pi qubit, right? It's, it's where the two uh, important wave functions localize. Um, and, and so what, how do we do this? Um, if, you, if you look at the, the shape of this potential, it seems like as far as tunneling and getting, getting from one well to another are concerned, this is not the most natural way for the wave function to spread out. But if you manage to make the mass of this fictitious particle really heavy in the vertical direction, but very light in the horizontal direction, then that is in fact uh, what you get. So uh, here's, here's sort of the numerical calculation of those two wave functions. Um, and the way you 
uh, you arrange for the masses to be so different is uh, you play with capacitances. So for in these circuits, it's capacitances that play the role of the mass of this fictitious particle um, and uh, you know, playing with, uh, with the values of capacitors, uh, capacitances is, is not so difficult. So you do get this joint uh, and near degenerate wave functions, which is precisely what, what we were after. Um, one quick comment as an aside. So you, you see, or, or you notice perhaps on the last slide that the circuit does form a loop. Uh, so it uh, is generally uh, sensitive to magnetic flux. Um, it turns out that in the parameter regime shown here, where you know the wave functions in the phi direction spread out over multiple of these wells, um, the states are actually uh, surprisingly insensitive to magnetic flux. Uh, so if you were to look at a fluxonium, you remember this, this parabolic potential with a cosine on top, and you look at wave functions that spread out, and you change the flux, it will change the modulation uh, the, of the cosine on top of the parabola, and the wave functions will adapt, uh, and the energies will barely change. Um, in fact, the energies uh, in that regime are exponentially insensitive to, to flux, and there's sort of a, it, it's a cute fact that in that sense, fluxonium is, is nearly the dual to, to a transmon. So just as the transmon is uh, exponentially insensitive to offset charge, so is fluxonium in this pr particular parameter regime to, to flux. Um, quite interesting and of course important uh, for, for the zero pi to fulfill its, uh, its promise of, of being uh, also protected from, uh, from dephasing. Here's a, here's a quick view graph of uh, you know, what, what do energy levels uh, and, and wave functions look like. So here's the, here's the picture just showing the phi and the theta degree of freedom. You see wave functions are uh, localized close to zero and to pi. And I've chosen parameters here that where you see a bit of the variation with respect to flux. Um, I could have made the parameter, the circuit parameters more extreme and it would have looked completely flat. Um, uh, so, so this is sort of just cranking it up a little bit. So you, you see that there's actually two, two energy levels. And then on the right-hand side, uh, we, we take into account again that, hey, actually there is this data degree of freedom, this harmonic degree of freedom that um, is supposed to decouple, but might uh, weakly couple. Uh, and you see that what that leads to is there's a whole bunch of copies of this lowest pair of levels. Uh, and that's because, well, the zeta degree of freedom actually has a relatively low energy. And so each copy here corresponds to another excitation of the zeta mode of this harmonic mode. Uh, and, and what's quite cute is that, you know, now that you have three circuit variables, your, your wave functions actually look a bit like, like, uh, like orbitals uh, in an atom, uh, right? So, and you, you can think about nodal planes and such, uh, and, and it all works, works out. Um, it, it's actually quite fun. And so from the theory side, we, we went uh, and uh, did a pretty extensive analysis of, of noise channels. Um, Peter Groszkowski was, was the one who did the hard work on, on that. Uh, there are direct noise channels where you know, your zero pi qubit uh, couples to, to, the, to the bath and the zeta mode is basically just a spectator. Uh, there are other uh, channels where the zeta mode is actually the one that mediates uh, the coupling to its own bath and, and affects the zero pi qubit uh, in that way. Um, and perhaps to give one example of, of an important channel of, of the latter type, um, I will mention shot noise dephasing, um, which in certain regimes can be, can be a limiting uh, noise channel for the zero pi qubit. Um, and so the, the simple the simple model for this is you have your fundamental qubit degrees of freedom here, uh, just labeled zero pi, and they're uh, just lumped here into the eigenenergies of uh, those two uh, degrees of freedom together. You recognize the zeta mode uh, as a harmonic oscillator, and uh, those two sort of subsystems um, are, uh, are dispersive, and so uh, in leading order perturbation uh, theory, you'll get an AC Stark shift of that, of that kind. And we, we actually worried about that AC Stark shift uh, quite a bit because you can, you can imagine the following. Um, this zeta mode degree of freedom, this zeta mode has relatively low energies um, and it might get thermally excited. So uh, excitations might enter this degree of freedom and exit. And each time they do through the AC Stark shift term, 
right, they will shift the effective zero pi frequency. And, and so it's, it's a little bit as if, if, if it's that extreme, right, then a single photon entering the zeta mode might just measure out uh, whether, whether the qubit, uh, the zero pi qubit is in the ground state or, or the first excited state. Um, and, and so uh, that's, uh, that's, really, uh, that, that's really bad. Um, and so uh, we worried about that and uh, figured out that in a parameter regime of that circuit that is actually quite challenging to reach experimentally, uh, life will still be good. Um, and so we were happy about that and, and calculated complete effective coherence times, which on paper look, look fantastic, uh, right? Uh, so, so we distinguished uh, sort of about different uh, degrees of how realistic our parameters might be. And we were uh, somewhat uh, optimistic perhaps that uh, this might be realizable. It turns out um, these parameters as, as listed here are still quite challenging for, for the experiment. Um, so experiment didn't quite get those numbers, but before uh, I get to those numbers, I uh, should first show you what, what the device in, in Andrew Hauck's lab uh, looks like. So remember, circuit has two, uh, two large inductors. They will be made uh, out of Josephson junction arrays. There are two capacitors and two uh, junctions by themselves. And this is the, this is the design uh, sort of in a in an artist's artist representation always sounds funny because I, I happen to be the artist in this case. It's one thing that COVID did to me that I, I had a lot of fun playing with graphics. So um, you, you'll see in, on the next slide that um, you know the, the sample looks like this, but layer thicknesses here are vastly exaggerated. So you have two big capacitances. Uh, here are uh, the two junction arrays that uh, serve as these big inductances, and then hidden here in the middle uh, in these two positions are the two Josephson junctions. Uh, so here, as promised, is the, is the real device. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, could I, could I interrupt quickly? Of course. Um, so we've got a couple questions coming in. So, so James Eckstein is wondering, so if you start in the lowest energy state, if you want to excite to the first excited state or other states, how, how would you do that? And how would you microwave your E field, uh, apply your microwave E fields? That's a, that's a fantastic question. And, and it's, let me just say this a little bit more broadly. Um, this, this whole game of protecting your qubit, right, goes hand in hand with the question of, well, you know, if it's super well protected, how do you still control it? Because if if nature can talk to it, maybe you can talk to it too. And I think it was John Martinez who <laughs> once, uh, once asked me whether we had just neutrinofied our, our qubit altogether, which would be a bad idea. Um, and so, of course, we're worried about that. Um, and I can show you, uh, I hope, let's see, if I jump forward, the, here is one way in which uh, in the experiment uh, gates were performed. Um, so you actually involve higher lying levels, um, right? Your qubit doesn't just have two levels, it's a complicated many level system. And some of the higher levels actually sort of span multiple wells. And uh, so for instance, with a, with a Raman type gate, you can kind of uh, transfer population through a higher level uh, from one well into the other. Okay. Hey, Jens, could I just uh, have a follow up on that? I was just looking at your graphics. You know, you showed this uh, the the schematic of the capacitors, inductors, and and Josephson junctions in an earlier picture, and now you've got this nice artwork. That's beautiful artwork, I should say, <laughs> and also the picture of uh, from uh, Andrew Hoek's lab of the actual layout. Um, should I imagine then that the microwave signal is coming in on that? <clears throat> excuse me, that bottom electrode. Yeah, precisely. Okay, so then you're driving across you're applying a microwave signal uh, across the uh, one of the two capacitors mm -hmm. so in your circuit on the other side that you had then you'd have some way of of, of, of representing that i guess um, right so you're, you're driving the the, the chart that that particular charge that, that's right yeah and and so the, the the in this picture right here the the gray area is grounded and the yes. microwave signals coming in on a coplanar waveguide yes. that is um, coupling, to, which is then capacitively coupled to, I guess, in in the schematic diagram, um, I guess it probably doesn't matter, one side of the capacitor. 
Right. And I, I should say that um, if so, if we were to zoom out, we would see that right. This this is actually uh, still part of a resonator, right? And it's the resonator that then couples to to just a, a, a wave guy or, or kind of going into a coax. Yeah. Cable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thanks. Sure. Okay. So there there are a few other questions, kind of technical questions. So let's see. So. Can the Josephson junctions all be fabricated in the same step? Is there anything required about additional fabrication layers versus a transmon? Uh, yeah, those are really good questions. I'm I'm not the perfect person to answer them, but my understanding is that uh, there there are no additional layers as compared to a transmon, right? So the fabrication, I think, overall is quite similar to also to what has been done in Fluxonium, where you have to figure out how to make these large arrays. I think I, I didn't say it explicitly, but those are you know, junctions, uh, junction arrays uh, consisting of 200 junctions. So you have to, you have, to have control of that, over that in, in fabrication. But otherwise, uh, it's, uh, it's still aluminum, aluminum oxide tunnel junctions. OK. And uh, Wolfgang has a question. Uh, regarding the Brahman gate, uh, if you take into account noise on the higher levels, can you still win versus, e.g., the transmon in terms of gate infidelity rather than just coherence time? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, so I I don't think the so the claim for the Raman gate that that they realized is is not that uh, you you immediately win over a transmon. Um, the, the comparison with winning over a transmon, personally, I, I find a bit dangerous in, in the following sense. Um, you know, the transmon, as I mentioned, has been around since, since 2007, uh, and it's been highly optimized. And, and, and if our, our first reaction to, to every new circuit, is, uh, you know, on day one of that circuit is, do you beat the transmon? Um, then we, we might as well stop all research on any other circuit uh, because uh, you know, these circuits are not optimized yet. Um, I can say that um, these, these gates are tricky also in a different kind of sense. Uh, so one thing you notice here in this plot, there's actually this innocent looking NG theta, which is an offset charge. And you see that um, up there, levels actually do become offset charge dependent again. So, so we're, we're wary of that. And we did some work on, uh, on optimal control pulses that become uh, quite robust with respect to possible fluctuations up there. Um, but um, Wolfgang, the, the, the question is, is, um, is an important one, of course. Ultimately, we do need to make sure that um, this is not a, you know, this protection hasn't been bought at the cost of uh, just making gates near impossible. And, and we think that that's not the case, but there's definitely more work and optimization to, to be done. Okay, awesome. All right, there's another, uh, I would consider quite technical question, um, but maybe at this point you can move forward and, and then uh, we can get more questions at the end. Okay, I'll take it definitely at, at the end. Let's see, I skipped uh, over one slide where I, I should have, uh, uh, at least mentioned uh, the, the times that, that were achieved, right? So the T1 time of, of more than a millisecond is, is quite respectable. It's uh, better than what we typically see for state-of-the-art transmons. Um, and the T2 time is, is not that splendid, um, has everything to do with the fact that, again, this parameter regime where everything looks perfect on paper is, is hard to access, uh, you know, inductances want to be really large, you don't want to have uh, too much uh, uh, parasitic capacitance to ground and such. And so you can tell that these wave functions that I'm drawing here, they're not, especially this one, not spread out over multiple fluxon uh, sorry, multiple wells in this fluxonium-like potential along that direction. And so there, uh, there's flux noise issues and uh, that's what, what kept this T2 time. Uh, in, in the range between 20 and 30, 30 microseconds. Now, we're still interested in, well, both uh, seeing in what ways we can improve and push uh, the zero pi idea, but we're simultaneously looking at alternative circuits. Here's uh, just quickly one that uh, Michel de Vauvet's group uh, looked at first. Um, it it uh, became known under the name of fluxonium molecule. It actually 
looks quite similar to the zero pi that I showed you. It's uh, just that an inductance here replaces what used to be a capacitance before. That potential energy is a bit like uh, taking a paraboloid and overlaying it with an egg carton, and you get uh, a potential that sort of looks like this. This was supposed to be animated, but clearly this is not working. Too bad. Um, but um, the, the upshot is, is just that there, there are other interesting circuits uh, that might in fact work better than zero pi. So this one here in particular uh, has the nice property that the, it has a third degree of freedom, let's call it zeta again. But uh, in this case, uh, that degree of freedom uh, doesn't sit at low energies. So thermal excitations might be less of an, of an issue in, in that particular case. And so we continue uh, to work uh, on that with, with Andrew Hauck's group and uh, my former student, Xin Yang Yu, who is now at Fermilab, is, uh, is, is part of that, that project as well. And then given the time, I think I have three minutes left. Um, I'll keep this part really short. Um, it's a little bit of advertisement anyways, but um, you know, it's, it's something that we, we hope is useful to the community. So there's this um, Python package, which my former postdoc, Peter Groszkowski, and I uh, actually coded together. It was a very fun summer when I really got to do coding again, which is something I, I enjoy. And it's been a good excuse to keep that up uh, since then. So we published this in 2019, and um, it's it's uh, become popular. Um, don't don't mistake that number for the number of users, right? There are multiple versions. Uh, people download multiple versions, but I think it's an indicator that uh, there there are people who, who are interested in this. And um, uh, why did we come up and uh, go into the effort uh, to to uh, code this up and write extensive documentation. It was sort of this insight that even within our own group, there are tasks that come up over and over again, computing energy spectra of superconducting qubits, visualizing wave functions, matrix element calculation, wanting to estimate coherence times, and then modeling coupled systems of qubits and oscillators, performing maybe multidimensional parameter sweeps, and then feeding everything into Qtip to do uh, you know, simulations uh, of, of dynamics. Um, and, uh, you know, all of that um, has become part of this, of this library, which currently uh, includes a number of, of hard-coded uh, superconducting qubits, like uh, the transmon, um, uh, the fluxonium qubit, um, uh, flux qubit, um, the zero pi qubit, and, and some others. And uh, one, one graduate student, uh, Sai, in, in my group is, is currently uh, working on uh, something that is also not completely new, uh, it, Andre Klotz, for instance, has a, has a package of that type where you can actually uh, sort of specify a generic circuit um, and, and have that be uh, converted into a Hamiltonian and, and then diagonalized uh, without, uh, without hard coding. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, as I said, you can compute and visualize qubit spectral properties, um, lots, of, lots of types of uh, plots that you can uh, kind of get in place with just one single line of code. Um, and uh, uh, what, what is quite nice, I think, is that this is not limited to individual qubits, uh, right? We want to model composite Hilbert spaces consisting of multiple qubits, uh, perhaps coupled to resonators. So here's an example of two transmon coupled to a resonator. And just to give you a flavor, so it's really simple to just create two of these uh, transmons, uh, change parameters, uh, create an oscillator. Much of this uh, can be done with these uh, little IPy widget user interfaces without uh, knowing all the Python in the background. And then you can just combine them into a joint Hilbert space and specify uh, interaction terms among them. Uh, and once that is done, you can run multidimensional parameter sweep um, sweeps, which um, uh, you know can be used, for instance, to generate transition spectra of the entire device. Right. So you might have uh, an external flux that you can tune. You have a coupled system of two transmons and a resonator. Resonator now is the typical spaghetti uh, picture of of all the all the transition energies, uh, which uh, now there's some functionality that allows us to highlight those that we're we're interested in. Okay, and then yeah, last not uh, last but not least, there's um, also some things that could be helpful if anybody ever uh, considers giving a class on superconducting qubits for for beginners. There's 
sort of uh, graphical user interfaces that let you play with all these superconducting qubits one by one, and you can visualize energy spectra. I don't know, this has some animation. I don't know how helpful that is. Um, yeah, so you get a flavor of what that looks like. Uh, you can play with circuit parameters. And um, I, I, I've, uh, I, I have dreams of once getting to, to teach a class on, on this topic myself for undergrads. And I think it would be, would be fun to have problem sets that, that actually make, make use of this uh, and uh, let students play with this and get intuition by, um, uh, by just using this package. All right, um, I think I'm out of time. Um, this is uh, the overview, which I'm not going to go through again. Um, so let me just leave you with uh, sort of two uh, take home messages. Number one is um, there's interesting circuits out there such as zero pi that might offer T1 and T2 protection. Um, and I think going forward, the thinking about these circuits will be important in our, uh, on our path to make it out of the NISC era, uh, perhaps. Um, they are challenging circuits um, for reasons, some of which I've mentioned, some of which Wolfgang also, also pointed out. Um, I think in the near term, Fluxonium is an, uh, is an attractive compromise. It's not fully protected, but it has some really uh, attractive properties compared to, compared to transmons. And then, yeah, here's uh, my, my little advertisement towards the end. Um, uh, use this package as you, if you're interested in it. Uh, we love to hear feedback and, and ideas of how to make it better and, and extend it in, in the future. And uh, that's all I got. So thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thanks, Jens, for an excellent talk. We had great attendance. Um, and there's time for questions uh, from the audience. So first off, so Ross Renzas, I think, had an unanswered question. Ross, if you still want a question, please feel free to speak up. Yeah, I'm curious about for the for the zero pi qubit. Um, it, at least on a silicon platform, you could potentially put superconducting vias in between the different kind of lines where the superconduct where the inductors are and where the uh, the single JJs are. Yes. I'm curious whether that would actually help potentially reduce crosstalk or otherwise have some kind of performance advantage and whether kind of these, you can see advantages in, in adding shielding and other sort of more sophisticated fab elements to this. Right. Um, so crosstalk, um, which, which type of crosstalk do you, do you have in mind actually? There's, um, there's certainly the, the issue of, of ground capacitances. And um, if, if vias can sort of make, make ground go, go a bit farther away, overall, that would be great. But there's, there's of course, pieces of metal all, all around you. And these, these Joseph's injunctions, junction arrays are large. So my, my understanding is, is, is that that is a tricky problem. But um, I'd be curious to, to hear more about the geometry that, that vias would, would, uh, would grant you. I'm a simple fab person. <laughs> I know how to make them. I just, uh, I'd be curious, uh, but it'd be interesting to think about, you know, there are some of these other circuit elements that are more difficult to make, the superconducting vias and air bridges and other things, caps, those sorts of things. Um, you know, one, one thing that I found really interesting in sort of the recent Chinese work on like high coherent sapphire qubits sort of model after, after the, the Princeton work, of course, was how much when they moved away from doing a single device to having you know, lots of qubits near each other, you know, they saw the coherence times go down quite a bit. And I'm curious whether um, there's opportunities not only to, 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 of course, you're gonna need to do shielding and things to isolate individual uh, zero pi qubits from each other, I would, I would imagine, but also even within the design itself, whether there's more opportunities to kind of use more advanced fabrication elements or additional layers and things to uh, to improve the performance. And I'm also curious whether the materials loss phenomena are pretty similar in terms of you know, the, the TLS aspects of things. Like how different is this from a fab perspective and how many different things can we do to, um, yeah. to improve the devices? But I, I'm just a straight up fab person. That, that's fine. I, I, and and I'm, I'm totally not, but, but I, I actually know that we have people in the audience who, who have, uh, who, who know everything about fab and devices. And, and I might just 
let them answer one thing, but uh, uh, some of your questions. But one thing that I, I just want to comment on is, um, so if you if we just briefly go back to uh, let's let's do the actually the experimental image uh, of the device uh, almost there, um, right? So one thing that uh, people familiar with uh, devices like that might notice is that as as far as these capacitors are concerned. It actually looks kind of crazy. If I had to zoom in with with length scales, it would it would be more convincing what I mean to say, which is those capacitors are not at all what you would want to do if you were worried about dielectric loss. Like for for a transmon, building capacitors like that would be would be a big no no. Um, but due to the fact that the wave functions that we want to work with in zero pi have this disjoint support nature. Uh, you actually have to worry much less about certain certain types of uh, of noise and on, and loss mechanisms uh, than than you than you might be used to. Okay, uh, a question from Angela. Yeah. So, and I had a question about um, the zeta mode. So you mentioned that for the zero pi qubit, it's at the moment kind of difficult to get into the right regime to actually like the deep, let's say zero pi regime. If you get into the deep zero pi regime, does the zeta mode come down in frequency so that you also now have to start to worry about, you know, populating the zeta mode as well? Yeah, so there's there's something there's something quite quite magical that happens there. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. Uh, the deeper we go into the zero pi regime, the lower the zeta mode comes in frequency. Uh, which seems like really terrible news uh, for, for photon shot noise dephasing. But it turns out that as you go deep into that zero pi regime, um, the dispersive, the, the AC Stark shift on the ground state and on the excited state become nearly identical as well. And then you actually don't care anymore about whether or not uh, thermal excitations enter and exit uh, your zeta mode or not. So, so there's a, there's a wonderful graph which I didn't put on the slides, but you, you sort of as you look at the photon shot noise dephasing uh, time, you, you sort of you, you start out uh, in, in sort of the, the soft zero pi regime, and and initially actually it looks like the the shot noise dephasing time is going to reduce, but then it really goes up once you get into the deep zero pi regime because the AC Stark shift uh, becomes nearly identical for those for those two qubit states. Okay, thanks. Okay, other questions. All right, uh, if not, um, Jens is around, I guess, for the rest of the day virtually to meet with people. I don't know if there are any openings still, uh, but let's thank him again for an excellent talk and for visiting us. Thank you, uh, my, my pleasure. And thank you all for, for the great questions.